my name is Shed, like the thing in your backyard. I go by she or they pronouns, and I'm a teaching and learning specialist at the Center for Teaching, Research, and Learning. I'll pass it over to my co-host to introduce themselves. Hi, good morning. My name is Gavin Fromey, and I'm a graduate assistant for teaching and learning. I'm also part of the teaching and learning team at CTRL, um, and thank you all for joining us. Yeah, we're excited to have you. Um, all right, so some guidelines for participation in this session. We always like to do this because it's helpful for you to do in your class as well when you're having a discussion, as we're going to talk about today. Um, so throughout this workshop, we kindly ask that you be present and participate in activities in a way that works for you. So you know yourself best, you know what you need. So whatever that looks like today, whether it be participating in the chat, video on or off, raising your hand if you'd like to share something, or just sort of um, you know, watching and listening, um, ask questions and share ideas in the chat. We want to hear what your ideas are, things that you've used that have been helpful for you. And then we want to answer your questions. Um, please feel free to use that raise hand function to speak. That's under reactions. Um, at any point, if you want to speak up, just make sure you use raise hand first so we can call on you and be generous with your knowledge and respectful of others. Knowledge is we're all bringing different experience and expertise so we can learn from each other. Oh, and we've enabled live transcription today, um, so you should be able to toggle that on and um, adjust that if you would like to use it. We're going to start with a warm up chat. So in the chat, we're going to ask you to introduce yourself, as well as your department, your unit, your program, wherever you are, you find your home on campus, and then share in your experience, what are some characteristics of a good class discussion. So if you're just joining us, we're getting started with a chat question where you can introduce yourself. Feel free to share your name, your pronouns, if you're comfortable sharing, your unit on campus, and then what comes to mind for you for some characteristics of a good class discussion? Diverting away from gripe sessions. Indeed, uh, sometimes you need some space to gripe, and then sometimes you need to finish griping and move on to the next thing, right? You need to move on to whatever sort of processing or action. Um, I've got some great introductions here. Con continuous development of conversations from other students. I love that. Um, we got a great variety of folks. A thoughtful comments, love that. Not just me too, and I agree, right? We see that on discussion boards a lot where students might say like, I really agree, right? And we want a much more robust engagement from them. Students building off each other's comments and questions. Love it when students respond directly to each other rather than me, <laughs> yes, the facilitator, having to mediate, absolutely, totally agree. And hello to some familiar faces, excited to see you here. Um, Multiple students engage with the material and sharing their views or opinions. Beautiful, beautiful, Noemi. Even participation across students. These are wonderful. Yeah. Bringing, so I'm seeing some themes, um, bringing out different views um, that the students engage with one another and not just with the instructor. I love that. Um, includes questions back and forth. Anything sticking out to you, Gavin? I like the idea that students feel welcome in the environment. Um, I noted one person says that um, when uh, students uh, feel welcome to share topics that might uh, be kind of risky, I think that's mm. a that's a great uh, that's a great uh, success when you have uh, that level of comfort in your classroom. And I'm seeing definitely a theme of like building on one another. So the students, maybe you start the conversation, but the students are the ones who advance it to more complex questions, which I love. These are great. Trying to trying to make sure I read everyone. Um, actually unmute. Yeah, it could be hard though. It could be hard to uh, get them out of their shell. Um, or feeling comfortable voicing a contrary opinion to what a lot of other folks are sharing. Yeah, feeling safe doing that. Excellent. 
Yeah. I'm going to keep, uh, I'm, I'm trying to keep an eye on this and I know Gavin will be, um, keeping track of them as well, but thank you for sharing. These are excellent. And I'm happy to say a lot of these are going to show up. If not, all of these are going to show up in the strategies that we're going to talk about today. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely see that theme again, like not just directed at the facilitator of the discussion, but peer to peer learning, which we're going to touch on. So a review of our outcomes for today, again, a great practice with students is to review what are the goals, like why are we having a conversation, what are we trying to accomplish. Uh, we want to explore different types of discussions and their relative advantages and disadvantages, so different things are going to work for different people and different classes. Um, identify strategies for facilitating and assessing engagement, engaging in respectful discussions in class. So how will you facilitate and then how will you assess? How will you um, evaluate the effectiveness or how um, helpful a contribution was? How will you grade if you plan to do that with a discussion? And developing a plan to incorporate discussions into your class sessions. So let's start with designing discussions and um, thinking about the context that you're in. Oh, thanks for that, Hannah. Yeah, a good, beautiful variety today. I'm really excited um, of, of folks participating. So here's one way to think about this. Here's a spectrum going from teacher-centered to student-centered. And as you can see in the middle, we've got things like teacher-assisted or guided. So the teacher sort of takes a bit of a step back right, and allows the students to take more responsibility with facilitating. And then peer assisted is where the students start to support one another in the conversation, right? So we can see a sort of spectrum here going from one to the other. And it's not necessarily that we should do one type all the time. It depends on what you want to accomplish with your students. So here's some examples across the spectrum. All the way on teacher-centered side, we've got initiate, respond, evaluate, or IRE. We're all probably very familiar with this, even if we haven't heard the term. The teacher asks a question, students raise their hand and answer, and the teacher confirms, right? What is X, Y, Z? A student says, it's this, and the instructor says, good, right? And we move on to the next thing. This is not necessarily a bad way to facilitate a discussion. It depends on if you're working on things like recall, remembering, understanding, that might be more useful for you. In the middle, we've got something like a Socratic seminar. So again, something we're probably familiar with, students prepare by reading text and drafting questions. The teacher might start the conversation, but the students are the ones who sort of take responsibility after that beginning. So students facilitate the flow of the conversation. Then all the way on student-centered, the teacher takes a total back seat on something like this. Maybe they give the instructions for the activity, but the students control and facilitate the discussion. So something like a fishbowl. I'm not sure if anyone's seen a fishbowl activity before, but it's pretty interesting. Um, a small group of students in the middle of class, and that could be physically in the middle too, discuss the topic while other students listen and analyze. And then everyone would sort of debrief the conversation together. Um, in the past, you know, I've had students, for example, uh, interview each other and other students observe the interview and then comment on it, right? Um, we got a question here, will students know in advance or they've been asked to prep for those? Great question, and I would say absolutely, yeah, to give students some guidelines, parameters, why are we doing this, what does it look like, but then maybe the day of the instructor takes the back seat, maybe intervenes when they think that something maybe needs to be commented on or moved. Um, so one way to think about this sort of spectrum is how familiar are students with the content? How exposed have they been to it? If students are less familiar with content, teacher-centered is probably going to be the most helpful. That is where you want to deliver the content and confirm basic understanding with students. All the way over, right, as students become more familiar with concepts, then they can take more responsibility for the conversation and they can facilitate amongst themselves. So as students become more familiar, then maybe they're ready to facilitate their own conversation, right? Like the fishbowl, they're able to take more responsibility for that discussion. I want to pause here and Gavin, do you have anything to add on this uh, slide? 
Um, I would also, just as a preview, note that it really can depend upon what you want students to get out of the discussions. Um, you know, there are a lot of skills that can be associated with uh, facilitating discussions and leading discussions, and sometimes it's important for students to develop those over the course of your class, uh, but sometimes it's not as critical, and therefore you might just have a you know, some opportunities for, for students to interact with each other, but with you as the facilitator. Um, I'll note that uh, I think that a lot of us have encountered this, but there's no greater buzzkill than an instructor asking a question with an expectation that there is only one correct answer. Mm -hmm. um, there, It really makes students uncomfortable because then they feel that, uh, oh, well, if I don't give the exact response that they're looking for, then I look like a fool. So be mm. be aware that uh, that students don't often like to ha answer questions with one specific answer. Ideally, if it's a discussion, you're looking for open ended questions. I love that, Gavin. That really like lowers the stakes too. Like answering the asking like an open ended sort of like what are some of the factors or why might right like so it doesn't feel like a binary. You know, it feel a few, someone can feel a little less on the spot when they contribute. So I love that. And please feel free to ask questions that you might have about this. But again, it really comes back to your goals. What do you want to accomplish? So then we're going to move on to something I bet. Uh, oh, that's the next slide. Sorry, I jumped ahead. I was going to, we have, it'll make sense in a minute, hopefully. Um, but here are types of discussion that we can think about. So we've got student to student versus student to instructor. So like we just talked about with the spectrum, you may have heard this phrase, sage on the stage. It's usually associated with the instructor who is lecturing, who is delivering information. They are the source of authority versus guide on the side, the instructor who offers some guidance and facilitation, but mostly takes that back seat and lets the students do the majority of the communicating. Um, and so again, this depends on what you want to accomplish accomplish and where you are in the student's learning journey with a particular concept. You could start a concept by having students speak amongst themselves about it, though. So it's really, again, it depends. Maybe the students feel really confident and they're ready to talk about this new topic, or um, maybe you notice they need a lot of guidance around this issue. It depends on where they are. Um, and then, of course, peer to peer learning is so important, and this is why we have to stay student centered, um, because it can't just be sage on the stage all the time. Right. Um, or hopefully we, we want to minimize the amount of time that the instructor does the sage on the stage role, because peer to peer learning research shows is the most effective type of learning. So students learn best from one another, and the more we can allow that, the better it's going to be. We've also got synchronous versus asynchronous. And I wanna point out that you can use asynchronous tech uh, or strategies, even if your class is synchronous. It could be a good way to bring some variety to the class. So you're all probably familiar with discussion posts on something like Canvas, but you might also try something anonymous like Jamboard, um, or you could use something that allows threads like Padlet. If you haven't used Padlet, students can upload media and videos and link to things, and that can be really interesting and engaging for them. You could also think about verbal versus written. So you probably don't think pair share before where the student thinks to themselves about the prompt. They talk to someone next to them in the pair about the prompt, and then they share out to the class. So that's one option that lowers the stakes so students don't feel like they have to bring their perfect polished contribution. Instead, they get to collaborate with someone before they share it out. You could do something like chalk talk, or you could call it more of marker talk, since not so many classrooms have chalkboards anymore. I don't, I don't think, right, Gavin? No. No, I wouldn't quite. say. No, yeah. not, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> They're not cool anymore. Um, and so this could be you write a prompt on the board and you let students come up and write their response to the prompt, or you could put post it, those big post its around the room and let students write on it. Um, did I capture chalk talk okay? I know there's a lot of options. Uh, I think that that is kind of the gist of this slide, though, is really mm -hmm. capturing that discussions are. Um, a broad concept. They can encompass so many different forms um, and thinking of them as simply an opportunity for students to have a conversation 
which is facilitated by the instructor is really limiting it in, in terms of the, the capabilities and the variety that, that discussions can entail. I really like that. Yeah, that and that variety can be really engaging for students in a lot of great ways. Um, and so we we had a comment about, you know, think something like chalk talk gets students out of their seat, which can be really great. I would just make sure to have an accessible option available for students since not everyone can get out of their seats for different reasons. So is there like a post it that is laid down on a table or is there a, you know, is there a way for students to write on a piece of paper and then maybe pass it while they're all sitting so you can still get the idea of the activity without it being dependent on student mobility. Um, and finally, keep in mind your course goals and equity goals. So first, what do you want to accomplish with your students? What do you want them to practice, which we're going to talk about more, but also your equity goals. So when we want to practice equity with our students, we know that um, not all, not one option is not going to work for everyone. Um, so we talked about, you know, something like chalk talk is not going to be uh, uh, available to everyone because of mobility differences, or um, maybe not everyone's able to speak up during class. So offering this variety is very helpful for equity, giving students different ways to participate, different options. So maybe they have an identified and an anonymous option. Maybe they have a verbal and a nonverbal option. Giving that variety helps them because not everyone's going to be able to participate in the same way. And that's fine. They can still show engagement in other ways, maybe unspoken, maybe in a small group, maybe silently, right? Um, okay. Uh, feel free to ask questions. And Gavin, please feel free to jump in for anything I might have missed. I just linked the research down here about the power of peer-to-peer -peer learning. And then this is the one that I thought you might say, oh, I know this one, which is Bloom's taxonomy, right? You may be familiar with it. Usually you'll see it in some sort of pyramid shape, right? But the idea is that we start at the bottom with uh, new information. We start with remembering and understanding, and we work our way up to evaluating and creating. And we want to try and work on those lower segments before we get to the higher ones. Um, your discussion can target different expressions of learning. You could work on remember, you could work on apply, you could work on evaluate with your students. It depends on where you want to be with them. And there's higher and lower level questions and prompts. So I want to give you an example. This is a little confusing because we're starting with higher level to match with the infographic here, but I'm actually going to start at the lower level at the bottom, if you can see my mouse here. So some lower level questions, that's going to be like apply, understand, remember. It requires learners retrieve information. So it's not that they are making anything new necessarily. It's not that they're evaluating or analyzing. They're showing comprehension. They explain, they demonstrate, they define, maybe they solve or compute, depends on where you are in the class. So with those lower level questions, you're checking basic understanding, right? Do they get the basic terms, dates, knowledge, whatever it might be, assess and monitor their learning, promote recall, retrieval is really important, um, and help keep learners' attention. Whereas when students are more familiar with the concept, you can move on to higher level questions, create, evaluate, analyze. So this requires learners to expand on the information they already know that they would have practiced with understand and remember, for example. So this encourages some complex cognitive processes. This is where you can really get into create, uh, sorry, creativity, critical thinking, problem solving, metacognition, or thinking about thinking, assessing their own learning. So it really depends on where you want students to be, but a basic idea of the taxonomy is we want to start at the bottom, and you might start with the questions when students are new to the information that shows that they remember and understand, and then moving up to apply and analyze, and then maybe at some point they'll be ready to evaluate and create. Some examples of questions, again, I'll start at the lower level at the bottom here. An example for a class in nutrition would be, what are the components of a nutritional plan? That's recall, right? Explain or enumerate. Journalism example would be summarize the debate within a famous case study of journalism ethics. Summarize, as you can see, is on the understand level here in orange. Whereas if we're moving to higher level prompts up here, for a class like nutrition, you might ask, if you were designing a nutritional plan for a patient, 
where would you begin? Now, this is all the way up on create, right? So they have to use these other skills to involve create. Um, that's imp implementing, but they also have to have memorized, they have to have applied, they have to have differentiated, right? So that's a higher level prompt. A journalism, an example would be propose a set of ethical guidelines for a news publication. That again is way higher up. So you wanna make sure that before you get there, students have engaged in the recall in the application or the evaluation. Um, can we talk about online polling tools? Oh, okay. Um, uh, do we have time for that, Gavin? Or should we hang on and talk about that a little later? Sure, we can, we can talk about those now. Cool. Um, I mean, I love online polling tools. Um, I mentioned Mentimeter earlier. Basically, Mentimeter should start paying me because I am promoting their platform more than they are. It's free and it's anonymous and it's very user friendly from my experience. Um, we've also got things like Poll Everywhere that you can integrate into uh, slideshows. Um, Gavin, what would you what do you want to add here? Um, I would say really there are so many tools out there that do similar things. It's really what it is you're trying to accomplish, um, you know, and take into consideration that there is sometimes a learning curve with some of these tools. So if students need to, or just a, a time investment, so if students need to create an account in order to use mm -hmm. it, be aware of that. Good thing about Mentimeter or, uh, is that you can just use it once you have a link, you can access it. However, um, note that uh, things like Jamboard, usually uh, I think you can use it. Uh, do you need a Google account? I believe you do in order to you use You don't, Jamboard. but oh, if that's you, you want to share files like, you know, documents, then I think you do. Yeah. Okay. However, as you, as you know, there is one a source that every student theoretically at AU has access to, which is Canvas. And so you have the ability to create polls in Canvas uh, using the quiz function. You can you can make those a, a kind of a, a anonymous poll using one of the um, the survey design features or the excuse me, the quiz design features to anonymize the responses. That's yeah. and and so something I would keep in mind, thank you for that, Gavin, because, the the canvas quizzes are it's easy to direct students to them and you can make them anonymous but you might want to keep in mind that um students uh like it, canvas still kind of records like answers like somewhere in the background mm -hmm. um so it's probably better for like a lower stakes sort of um question or just assure your students that you've made it anonymous um so that they know it's not you're not identifying them based on that. Um, but I think that's a great tool. Um, if, you, if you'd like to have that sort of like uh, anonymous engagement from students, I think that, that could be a great tool. Oh, and Zoom has polls too. I forgot about that. Yeah. Zoom has polls. You but just have to set them up ahead of time. Yeah, exactly. What well, we're currently on. Yeah, right, <laughs> our current platform. Whoops. <laughs> All right, so we want to do a chat check in and please feel free to share questions that you might have at this point, we want to answer them. And uh, in addition, if you don't have a question, or if you do, we want to know in your experience with class discussions when you facilitated, have you found that they've been teacher centered have they been student centered have they been somewhere in between or a mix and tell us why. Oh, and Mac shared top hat in the chat. Thank you, Matt. And I'm reminded Cahoots, I think, is another popular wow. option. They love Kahoot. I think it's with a K, right? Yes. Uh, but please, let's not. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. There's like uh, colors so... and shapes and music. Sorry, in okay. case uh, in case the question got lost in there, we were talking <laughs> yeah. about other things. Um, yeah, we were just curious um, if you could, in the chat, share... Um, whether you believe your class discussions are teacher-centered, student-centered, or somewhere in between, and why. Got a great point here. Sometimes it's inadvertently teacher-centered. <laughs> like, you try to get the conversation going and it's not happening. Mm -hmm. That happens all the time. Yeah. 
And sometimes in a moment like that, something that I might like to do is something like a temperature check where students like literally with their hands, I'm like, you know, like, are we not like, are we able to have this conversation? Do we not have the energy for it? Should we switch to something else and get sort of like a nonverbal confirmation from them about like what they need and why they're not speaking? Um, yeah, sometimes the material gets pretty dense and you just need to deliver, yeah, the information. We will be talking about uh, Charlene's point later on, yes. Yeah. Mm, that's interesting. Core classes have become more teacher-centered. Other classes tend to be more student-centered. So it could depend on, you know, like we said, the class, what you want to accomplish, the discipline. Hmm. Nice. Okay. <laughs> Block class starting at eight and ten. So teacher centered. Yep. <laughs> Good time for polls, probably, and some some nonverbal uh, engagement. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes mm -hmm. that is that is what it takes. Yeah. I have really felt this, especially as it gets um, later in the semester. I can really feel the energy dropping in some conversations. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for sharing this. So I see that a lot of folks, and I think this is a very common sort of concern that we tend to have, hence why we're doing this workshop, is you organize a discussion and then the students just don't engage, right? Um, so that's something that we're going to think about. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and thank you also for sharing the different strategies that you're using. I see like some think, pair, share, and some reflection. If they didn't, pre if they didn't prep, it's really hard. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, I'm going to pass it over to you, Gavin. Sure. Um, so next slide. If this were uh, for 30, 40 years ago, you could use the clicker. Um, so I generally find it helpful to think of things chronologically. Um, and so we're going to provide an overview of different strategies you can use to improve student engagement in discussions. And believe it or not, these can take place before the course even begins. They can take place uh, before the class session even begins. Um, and of course, they can take place during the class session. Um, and so I'm going to go through these in the order in which I think it is most likely that you would do them. Um, so should thank you. Um, when it comes to things that you can do to improve the quality of class discussions before the course even begins, um, it becomes very important to understand what your goals are for the discussion. So we talk a lot in course design about backwards design, which is to say, think about what the learning outcomes are for the course. Think about what you want students to have accomplished by the end, and then develop the means to arrive at that point. So when it comes to discussions, think about what you want students to achieve. What are your goals for having these discussions in class? Um, are there specific sets of skills that students need to practice? Are there uh, areas of content that they need to uh, be aware of and learn over the course of the course? Um, so really thinking about essentially how these discussions can build on students' achievement of the learning outcomes and what their function is within the course. Um, yes, small group discussions do work well. Um, so yes, purpose, the, having a purposeful discussion. I think that having a purpose is kind of a, an essential component to almost any aspect of a course, because when students uh, say, well, why are we doing an assignment? It feels like bu busy work. You can say, well, here is the exact function of this assignment within the architecture of your achievement of the learning outcome. So if students are asking, well, why are we doing these discussions? You can theoretically say, well, this is the idea that I have. Um, next slide, Shed. Um, this is a quote uh, that actually Shed, I'll give you uh, full credit for, for having picked this one out, but I think it's a, it's a fun one. It comes from uh, James Lang's Cheating Lessons. 
Um, every time you engage in the retrieval of a specific piece of information, you are opening up and strengthening the neural pathways that lead from that long-term memory to your conscious awareness. And those pathways remain more accessible for you the more often you use them. So there is a kind of a neuroscience, the science of learning um, foundation that you can use to justify why these kinds of discussions are important because they give students an opportunity to, to talk about the content and reinforce their learning of it. So if students have done readings at home, they come to class and then they talk about them, that provides a reinforcement that makes it easier for students to, to build those kinds of connections and remember the material for a longer period of time. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and of course, the big question that comes up whenever people talk about any form of participation is that which uh, uh, that of assessment. Um, so what it is that you're actually hoping discussions are going to assess? Are they assessing a result or a process, which is to say, are discussions a uh, artifact of learning? Are they essentially the opportunity for students to demonstrate that they have learned a concept? Or are they a part of the learning process? As in, like I said, the uh, they're an opportunity for students to talk about the readings and to really answer, get their questions answered and, and sort of work through the content collectively. So identifying what you consider to be the function of discussions within the assessment of a course. Um, and this can play a role in grades as well. Some people, as a way to incentivize students to participate in uh, discussions, uh, may decide to assign grades for participating in discussions. Uh, Shed, you can go to the next slide. Um, if you do decide to um, pursue a graded option, um, there are a variety of rubrics that you can adopt, some of which uh, would include a, this is an example up here of a holistic rubric. So um, it incorporates what it would look like at varying stages of, uh, of, of achievement within a given rating. So a, a, within a given criteria, in this case, a quality of discussion. So, um, a student comes to class prepared to talk about the material. Um, they're actively engaged in conversation with their peers. They would get full credit. Um, they come to class, um, but they don't seem as well prepared, but they're interested in engaging nonetheless. Perhaps that might receive partial credit. And if they don't come to class prepared at all and they don't talk, they might not receive any credit. So if you're hoping that a grade might incentivize students to talk, uh, then that is an option. Uh, next slide, Shed. Um, and I'll get into the pros and cons of grades in a moment, but I'm just providing examples of rubrics for now. Um, here is an example of a checklist rubric. Um, so it's kind of a binary choice. Either the student accomplished the task or they didn't. So they were prepared or they weren't. They contributed or they didn't. Um, they interacted with their peers or they didn't. Um, so if you are interested in a quick and easy way to really uh, delineate between a student's participation within a discussion and lack thereof, um, a checklist rubric is another option. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but ultimately, the reason for your decision as to whether or not to grade discussions should be grounded into your uh, uh, your goals for those discussions. So if discussions are playing a significant role in students' achievement of the learning outcomes, um, and if you have, you know, uh, and if there is a functional purpose, such as practicing skills or um, doing uh, or performing some element that is uh, necessary to their learning process, um, be sure to include that in your syllabus statement. Um, having a syllabus statement that outlines your uh, policy around discussions, as well as your motivations and goals for discussions, is essential. It tells students why these discussions are taking place and how they can best prepare for them. Um, next. So before the actual discussions take place, there are a few things that you can do. Um, 
one of which is setting communications expectations. Um, so there are obviously people can think that they know how to engage in discussions, but unless you're actually talking with students and saying, you, these are the expectations that I have for how you should engage with your peers in class, um, there, then there is room for, uh, uh, let's say, uh, less tactful conversations and exchanges. So establishing guidelines for how to respond um, if a student says something that uh, another student takes offense at, um, establishing guidelines for what happens if that takes place, um, clarifying the terms and practices, so making sure that students know what they need to do to prepare for discussions, what the expectations are if they don't meet those, um, what, will, what the consequences will be if students come to class not prepared to discuss. Um, and also, you know, just the general transparency about everything that was included in the syllabus statement, your goals for these discussions, um, you know, what is, uh, you know, the what ways you have for students to contribute, if not verbally, um, and how those uh, contributions will be assessed. All right, finally, we get to the one that everyone I'm sure is interested in hearing, which is how to, you know, tips for facilitating these discussions during the class sessions itself. Um, obviously, as Shed pointed out, there are so many uh, options for the ways that discussions can take place, um, not just the modality and not just the, you know, the focus of, you know, teacher-centered versus student-centered, but also just assessing different levels of knowledge. But here are some general tips that work um, when you are facilitating a discussion. Um, as I said earlier, being sure to frame the conversation with prompts and questions that have multiple answers is key. Um, making sure that students are comfortable to, you know, answering those. Um, because if you're asking them just a simple, like one answer question, then it becomes a fishing exercise where you're really just waiting for a student to give you the right answer so that you can move on. It's not a, it's not a conversation. It's a, uh, call and response. Um, be mindful of your language. Um, I actually had a conversation with several students, uh, just this past week, uh, getting their feedback on the aspects of a good class discussion that they considered important. Um, and one of the term, one of the things that they brought up was tone and the choice of language that an instructor uses when asking questions during class. Um, it can make a huge difference if you are speaking with an encouraging tone, if you're using language that says, I want to hear what you have to say and I want you to express it rather than we're wrapping up on that point, let's move on to the next. So do you have any final thoughts or something of that sort? Really tells a student that you're not interested in hearing what they have to say. You want them to just get it out as soon as possible so you can move on to the next thing. So being mindful of your language is critical. Um, consider how to reply to an incomplete, inaccurate response. Um, or when a student says something that is at odds with uh, the prevailing perspectives, um, you know, thinking about how you can encourage students to expand upon their uh, comment or thinking about how you can encourage students to reflect upon, you know, the, the statement that they made. If they said something that was inaccurate, how are you going to prompt them to consider and reflect upon that and perhaps reconsider their question? Or how might you uh, consider having a student offer a different perspective and how are you going to navigate the feelings of those student if a student is uh, asked to be corrected you know how's that student going to feel so you have to be very sensitive to um you know the uh you know students where they're at if students are learning the material and they're not quite sure how to answer things that's that's perfectly understandable so creating a space in which students feel welcome to express ideas even when they're not correct is you know is essential um and finally uh, not finally but don't be afraid of silence this is something that i i saw a comment on earlier um Shed, you pointed out an interesting technique, the water bottle trick. Uh, do you mind explaining that? 
it sounds complex, but really just when you ask a question, you take a swig of water um, or whatever beverage you have. And um, not only does it keep you hydrated, but it encourages you to slow down a little and wait. Um, and it also shows, you know, that you're comfortable waiting. Some people like to count in their heads. Um, do, Gavin, do you know, is there like a common amount of time you're supposed <laughs> drink a whole bottle of water, chug the water. You know, <laughs> it's just... it's really a, um, you know, kind of a, a <laughs> case by case basis, uh, but we have a hand up, uh, Julie, please. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, uh, whoops, yes, trying to turn my camera. Sorry, thank you. Um, I had a question about the prevailing perspectives. I think that's mm -hmm. somewhere different than the citing, um, citing uh or, yeah you said something about citing sources um mm -hmm. I, I understand the citing sources i'm not sure i'm clear about prevailing perspectives um i just I, what would constitute a question or comment that you know um how would you determine that, so yeah. that that is a uh, sorry did i interrupt you nope nope i just i don't think i asked my question very well but that, i'm i'm confused about that that language and that that prompt Sure. Um, so an example would be, and I think this is something that Hannah and I actually uh, discussed at our workshop a few weeks ago on participation. So one debate exists whether or not an instructor should grade student participation at all. Some instructors say that grading participation incentivizes students to actually participate. That's why I brought up the whole concept of grading discussions, whereas others think that you shouldn't have to, you know, force students to speak, you sh they should do it voluntarily. So imagine you're in a class setting in which you propose this discussion topic and the majority of students said, well, I don't think you should uh, grade participation, but there was one or two students that said, actually, I think it's important to grade participation because I'm not sure that students are gonna do it if you don't grade it. So how are you going to navigate a situation in which there are only a few students that are at uh, an opposite end of an opinion that the rest of the class holds and doing it in a way that doesn't make it feel like those students are, are isolated or are in the wrong necessarily, but um, are just comfortable offering a different opinion. Does that make sense? It does, but I'm just wondering again, how you manage that? Um, because we have that uh, with political opinion in a lot of our um, situations. So there might be one or two folks who I think feel like they're kind of odd person out. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'm just wondering how you do that, how you accurately incorporate the whole range, even if there's a dominant uh, mindset or perspective. Well, it can come down to the preparation for discussions. So establishing those guidelines and preparing students for the I, the the condition in which hey, there's gonna be a situation in which I propose a discussion prompt and some students may present an opinion that the majority don't agree with. Um, just, you know, speak openly with students about that and let them know, so how, you know, how, how are, you, are you comfortable with this scenario? Um, most of the questions that you're gonna be proposing in discussion are open-ended, so there's not a correct answer, I suppose. Um, and so if, if you're really uh, providing a space for students to have a conversation um, and some students are expressing an idea that the majority don't agree with, um, I think then it becomes a question of ensuring that those students feel that they can express their minority opinion without feeling as though they're being attacked by their peers. Um, so making sure that these conversations stick to um, you know, expressions of opinions, but not necessarily a debate about the merits of those opinions, because obviously you can get to a situation where people feel a, like their beliefs or their opinions about a topic are wrong because they're not the way that everyone else thinks. And that, and that can be quite challenging if you're in a situation where students feel like they're uh, being attacked for their beliefs, it becomes an un- uh, unwelcoming space for conversation. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I think the idea that stressing it's not a debate, that's just, I think, in, in easy language to um, use and maybe have folks digest. 
Yeah. And at the end of the day, one thing that I always encourage everyone to do is just talk with students about it and be very honest and say, hey, I'm I'm struggling with how to deal with, um, you know, conversations in which, you know, it's a controversial subject and some people have very strong opinions. How do you think uh, we can do this in a way that doesn't hurt anyone's feelings? Does that make Thank sense? You. Thank you. Yeah. I really like that, Gavin. And I, I would think like to that, just reminding them like this is not about a winner. This is about understanding. Mm -hmm. Um, this is, you know, in every discipline, you have to ask questions and explore different perspectives. And so no one is winning. Everyone is leaving the room trying to understand other points of view and just compare and contrast them. I would also mm -hmm. say um, if you uh, are want to introduce a perspective without it resting on one or two students, bringing in like a media like a video or a reading that expresses that perspective. So it doesn't lay it like on those students' shoulders. And then we have some really good thoughts in the chat in case you are able to look at them, but I know we're also talking. Um, uh, yeah. But we got some really cool, and Hannah shared a really cool resource as well. Um, and I wanted to throw something out there quick. If you struggle, because I, I feel like this may have, been part of the last question do you struggle with like you know there's one or two folks who are really speaking up and it doesn't feel like there's space for other voices something I like to do is say I want to hear from people who haven't spoken yet or can we make space for voices that aren't like coming up as much and then that sends the signal to the students who are speaking a lot uh, to kind of give some space all right turning back over to you Gavin thank you but that is a great segue though Shed because the as you see the the final point on here um, well, actually, no, there was another point before I, avoid cold calling. I'll say that, you know, and debates, but, uh, cold calling, especially it's a, it's a, it's a real downer, you know, students, no one likes to be cold called. It's really uncomfortable. It makes you feel like, um, you know, you're, you're being punished somehow. So I would say if you're hoping to, you know, instill a welcoming environment and one that promotes conversation, don't cold call on students. Um, but the actual final point on the slide, be patient and flexible is uh, essential. That is, I think, what you are getting at partly shed, which is to say that, um, you know, if there is a situation in which some students are dominating the conversation, um, you know, be prepared to, you know, try to shift the attention to the focus to people that haven't had a chance to speak yet. Also, as um, was pointed out earlier, what happens if you're in a class setting and students just don't want to talk. You propose a question, you take, a, you know, drink an entire bottle of water and students are just not interested in talking. Then it might be a situation in which you have to do uh, one of a couple things. You can either uh, have the discussion be moved to a written, a nonverbal uh, format in which students propose ideas, you know, through Jamboard or through another uh, platform, or sometimes it's just best to move on. Sometimes you just need to say students just aren't feeling it today. And you would know better than anyone. You're, if you're the instructor, you're in the room, you can sense the, sense the tone. Um, so some, and some days students just aren't feeling like they want to do that kind of communication. And you need to have that, the flexibility built into those class sessions to, to be able to manage that. Um, because that will happen on occasion. But in general, having that variety, building in that variety of discussion formatting is one way that can really help prevent a situation in which students don't feel like talking, but they may feel like expressing themselves through other manner, through other uh, mediums. Uh, next slide. Um, and as I was saying, uh, emphasize and add nonverbal options. So some examples are a gallery walk. If you've never done one of these, um, you can post um, poster boards or just have sections of a whiteboard in which uh, students are able to, in which you have written uh, prompts and students will go around the room or around the board and write their responses to the specific prompts. So it's kind of like a uh, in-person version of what you might perform on a Jamboard or other online platform. Um, digital discussion or polling we talked about already. Um, 
you know, just having students write down questions, you know, giving them a few minutes to write down their ideas. Um, small group or partner uh, uh, exercises are a classic. I've had many uh, students say that they often find talking in front of the entire class intimidating. However, if they are given the option to talk in a group of three or four students, that can sometimes get them more comfortable discussing the subject. And then maybe after there's been a group conversation, they feel more comfortable talking about it in front of the class. Um, so having that variety in, in terms of the scale of the conversation can also be helpful. And uh, as Shed, I think, pointed out earlier, temperature checks, getting a, a, a sense of how students are feeling um, is, is important for these kinds of situations. Uh, next slide, please. Um, final uh, one that we're dealing with. So um, this isn't necessarily a sequence of facilitating discussions as much as it is a distinct category. Um, we are aware that these discussions have a lot of, uh, you know, inherent challenges, especially, you know, these days there's, um, there, people have very strong opinions and it's important to uh, facilitate discussions in which people are, uh, have, a, have grace for one another, in which they are willing to, um, you know, as Shed pointed out, call in rather than calling out. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the difference between those two um, soon, but essentially you want to encourage students to, um, rather than when someone says something that, um, that might be uh, upsetting to other students or hurtful to other students, rather than uh, singling that student out and pointing out how what they said was uh, was a terrible thing and that they should feel bad. Uh, calling in encourages them to reflect upon what they said or recontextualize the conversation as an opportunity for other students to consider, well, how in this situation should we respond? How is this a how how can we build on this as an opportunity to reflect upon the standards for our discussions that we have established prior in the course. Um, you might even consider it an opportunity for students to work on their peer-to-peer -peer learning, uh, which is to say students have an opportunity to um, work out with, this, with the subject in question how to address it, rather than you, the instructor, stepping in and being the, the force that exerts influence in the situation, you might say, how, all right, students, how, how would you respond to this? What, what is an appropriate response to um, when someone says something like that? Um, and point, you can also point to group and community learning. Students are ultimately accountable to each other, avoiding one-on-one -on -one conflict. That debate style is essential. Um, next slide, please. Um, as promised, calling in. So inquire or reframe to pull the positive intention out of a statement. So asking the student, what do you mean? I think I understand what you're saying. Correct me if I'm wrong. You know, trying to, to get them to explain themselves and thinking about what they said in the context of their peers. Because sometimes people say things um, and they're not thinking about how what they say affects others. So, you know, get them to, to think about that and, and to give them an opportunity to clarify. Um, pose these incidents or agreement or, or agreements. Uh, pose these incidents as agreements and community commitments. Can we try to be more careful with our wording around this issue? Let's consider how these words impact our classmates. Um, this is probably the hardest part of discussions. Um, the addressing conflict is something that will come up in every discussion and it requires tact and patience and empathy. And the best way to go about it is to, to prepare in advance. So talking with students about the possibility of there occurring an incident in which someone says something that they will take offense with and how to respond to that is essential to do before the incident occurs. Um, so an ounce of preparation is, is really what is counts in this context. Um, be, be clear and ultimately be clear with students, disagreement is not wrong, making comments which are rude or insensitive is. So, 
this gets back to uh, Julie's point earlier. Sometimes students can express opinions about things, and you know that doesn't necessarily mean it's uh, wrong for a person to have that opinion. However, if they're making a comment that is rude or insensitive to another student, that is wrong. Um, uh, and oh my goodness, I have talked for a long time. Um, I'm sure that there have been a lot of questions in the chat, but would anyone like to express any uh, verbal questions at this time? And if or, I could add something to, oh, yeah, sorry. please. No, please. Uh, something that popped in my head. I think you express this really well with like, um, you know, the, the accountability to classmates. Um, it's not just about the students being accountable to you. And sometimes they might think that they're just accountable to you to remind them, this is not about what you as the instructor like or don't like. It's about how your actions and words affect your classmates. And that helps prevent it from being that one-on-one -on -one conflict that um, that might come out of a moment like this. So it's, you know, that's why we say like, that, that's where you can say, um, you know, let's consider how these words impact your classmates rather than well, the student might expect you to say, I don't like that. Well, it's not about you and them. It's about them and the class too. Thank you, Shed. That's a very good point. Um, do we have any uh, other questions at this time? Either, I guess, uh, verbally or non-verbally, let's put it that way. And if not, uh, then I guess we can move on to our case study. Shed, would you like to give a give a nice read? I was muted. That's embarrassing. Okay, so. Um, uh, here is our case study. You are teaching an education course and want to explore the debate surrounding whether, surrounding whether class participation should be graded or not with your students. You feel a discussion in class might be a good medium for students to explore this topic. So we are actually going to ask you all to discuss, um, but uh, uh, how much time do we have, Gavin? I would give it 10 minutes. We're going to take 10 minutes in breakout rooms for you to discuss this topic. And so we're giving you a discussion opportunity, right? Um, and so what we want you to do, here's our parameters. Um, we are asking you to brainstorm a discussion based on that case study, which we'll also share again in the chat when you're in your rooms. Keep in mind these details. Um, and you may not have time to get to all of them, but that's okay. What skills or content? Did student, might students need to prepare them for that discussion? How might you ensure that the discussion is equitable and accessible? What might it look like if it were student versus teacher centered? Which one of those do you wanna move towards? Uh, what types of questions or prompts might you ask to assess that higher level knowledge? And how will you assess? So given your amount of time, it might be better to pick you know, a few, a couple, one or two of these questions to really think about. But the idea is to brainstorm that discussion and how you might want it to move based on what we've talked about today. Keep an eye on the chat. Okay. I see some folks have to leave. That's okay. Um, before we go into our rooms, what questions do we have? good. All right. I'm going to create the breakout rooms. Excellent. So Are we good? I think so. I'm going to send the prompt to everyone. Um, I'm going to move. Sam um, yeah, uh, so I think I'm debriefing here. Mm -hmm. uh, so just in the interest of time, if you would like to share in the chat, maybe we could do one verbal share. 
um, to make sure we don't hold you all over time. Would anyone like to share, like, what were some of the things that you thought about? What are some of these questions that you answered or brainstormed around? Um, yeah, Scott, please go ahead. So I was with a couple of professors, Keisha and Robert, who have graduate students, and there was some a little bit of consensus of, unquote, cold calling or just calling on students is okay, especially at a graduate level, because that's what's going to happen in their real world or maybe happening depending on the program they're in. So if at some point we're too a little bit kid gloves and too cuddly, maybe we're not serving the students for what's going to happen when they graduate, especially for graduate students. That's a good point. If, if it serves the interests of the learning outcomes, like if it's going to prepare students for a real world scenario, that might be an exception. I would say there's definitely a distinction between um, teaching the students to be ready for the real world and then subjecting them to the things they would experience in the real world. So we can kind of at once recognize maybe my students need to learn to deal with cold calling, but that doesn't necessarily mean they have to deal with it in the class. So can we teach them the skills to be ready for cold calling without necessarily subjecting them to it? Because well, we know that should, it's not- just to, just to push back, wouldn't the class be the perfect place to do that? because it's a safe space, the professor's caring, this is not gonna impact their job performance, uh, there's no gonna be no pay cut or anything like that. And mm -hmm. just let them know in advance, this is why we're doing this, this is why I'm doing this, it's to, to get, have you get better. I guess so I would get their consent if they, you know, get a feel for how they feel about getting cold called early on in the in the course and say, hey, I'm I feel like I want to, you know, do this cold calling thing because I feel like it's going to help you be a better instructor or whatever going forward. And just say if they if they seem on board with it, then I think go for it. But if they they push back hard, uh, you may want to reconsider. Yeah, that's always a good point to check with class and, and Gavin mm -hmm. uh, to cite from when you, you guys said about words and importance. I don't mm -hmm. use cold call calling on the students because the material was assigned. Ah, uh, yeah. It's yeah. not a surprise thing. I'm not, we're not trying to, it's not gotcha. It, this was assigned. Let's have a discussion. So I don't even use the word cold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just keep in mind, you know, um, there's a lot of aspects of the real world that students have to deal with, um, but that, you know, um, the research on cold calling, if anyone else knows more about this, but that, you know, cold calling is not the best always for learning. So it's good to teach them to deal with it, but not necessarily valorize it, right? Like, can we do both at once? Can we show that there's some issues with it as a practice while preparing them for the real world situation of it? Um, we had a hand from Miss Ricky. Oh, yeah, yeah. I want to make sure we get that. Oh, I'm sorry. That was when you asked for people to say that what they talked about. So I could put my hand back down. Oh, no, you can go ahead. Oh, go ahead. so one of the things I did put in the chat that we discussed because we had three people in our group who, who were talking and um, one of them was a student and a staff member. And he mentioned sometimes for the discussion or the participation points, it's not clearly outlined. So if you're gonna have people be interactive, make sure you are clear on what that looks like, how they can gain the points and, and things like that. And the second part we added to have various ways they could participate, have the, they can raise their hand, they can unanimously submit something that comes up on a board where people can read, they can ball up a piece of paper and put it in a box, they can mm. tell you later, just have various ways so it's not one clearly defined way. And maybe at the beginning of the class have students suggest the ways that they could participate and earn points. Very good points. Yeah, that's uh, that's the yeah. All right, Shed. I think it's uh, maybe wrap up time. I'm sorry that we weren't able to to get to everyone. Gavin yeah, says, "Put on your shoes. We're at Grandma's house." All right. Final reflection. Um, in the chat, we would love to hear from you. And if you still have questions, please do keep asking them because we'd love to answer. Lindsay has put our evaluation in the chat, and if you have time to fill that out, just a couple minutes. We would love to read your feedback and we take it really seriously and we'll do our best to integrate and consider um, everything that you share. We're not just consider, uh, implement it. What's a class discussion you're looking forward to facilitating? Maybe this semester, maybe in the future. 
um, maybe next week. Um, and what are you excited about? What are you looking forward to? Oh, and Gavin has shared. Oh, you can go ahead, Gavin. Sorry, stepping on your lines. Oh, no, it's quite all right. I also shared the slides from today in the chat. We will be sharing those uh, uh, as well in a follow-up email, but in case you wanted to get a first look at them now, they're, they're there for you to download. So another important accessibility uh, uh, strategy that we want to model. So what are you excited about? What's a discussion you're looking forward to and why? Mm, love that. Yeah, show students what a good part, what a good contribution looks like. Yeah. If they feel like they don't know, they're a lot not likely to participate, right? Because they're worried that they'll do a bad job. So giving them some examples is really great. So feel free to share what you're looking forward to and then questions, thoughts, strategies, we would really love to hear them. And if you're ready to head out, if you don't mind filling out that survey for us, it's really helpful. Oh, that's a good question, Noemi. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think I can, um, something I can do is download the chat and collate, is that the right word? Uh, collect the contributions and, uh, we can share them out with our follow-up email. So I will do that. Good suggestion. 1980. Oh, that sounds so cool. Uh, on the films of John Hughes. Yes. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, if you can get some interesting media in there. If you can, anytime you can connect it to things that feel kind of personal to students or that sort of intriguing, like a piece of media, that is really going to get the conversation going. Love it. I want to take that class. That sounds awesome. Yeah, thank you. And I'm just going to share our contact information here. If you'd like to request an individual consultation with us, please do feel free. We're really happy to meet and chat with you about whatever you're working on in your teaching. We've got a lot of upcoming events for this semester that you can attend. And you can also see more of our resources online. Um, and I've forgotten our email at the end there. My apologies. So I will put in my email in the chat. And then I believe Gavin's is their full name it's with a dot in the middle, right? Um. I believe it is, I can, I can type it. In okay. Okay. Chat. I was going to see if I'd learned it, but. <laughs> and then our email is down there as well. Excellent. I, in that case, I will download the chat now before I forget. Good idea. I, I find that to be the hardest thing to remember for some reason. I know. <laughs> and we will follow up with uh, resources and the presentation materials. Hmm. Eventually, there will be a recording of this session available on our website. 